those as we go along and we'll certainly catch up to them during the panel discussion. Uh, you may ask any questions you feel that are appropriate, so please do feel free to do that. You're also welcome to provide feedback uh, once the webinar is completed and the website is shown right there. Also, if you're not a member of FIP, we encourage you to consider uh, joining FIP. Next slide, please. Uh, today, we'll actually do a little bit of uh, uh, an introduction around why we need, have, need to have a needs-based data-driven culture. Uh, we'll talk about the FIP development goals from a regional and national uh, priority perspective. We'll talk about the development and use of indicators to track the progress for FIP goals. And uh, we'll have a panel discussion that will really bring both a regional and a national perspective uh, to the discussion. And I think you'll enjoy the group we have because we have some fine panelists today. Uh, Chris will then sort of do a summary and a close of the event. Uh, we do uh, spend some time talking about needs-based data-driven culture and why that's important. We'll try and identify approaches to measuring progress towards universal health coverage and health-related development goals. We'll describe the FIP development goal priorities and how indicators were developed. And we will explain how monitoring and evaluation of the development goals contributes to evidence of outcomes and impact. Next slide, please. Chris? Thanks, Bob. Hi, everyone. Um, the reason we're here today and couldn't be here without them is the FIP development goals, which were launched by FIP back in September 2020. And they are a key resource for transforming the pharmacy profession over the next decade, globally, regionally and nationally. They align with FIP's mission to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences and education and are set to transform pharmacy in alignment with wider global imperatives underpinning the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So these development goals completely align with the UN Sustainable Development Goal, particularly the one around health. And that really is what helps us track progress towards universal health coverage. The evidence and impact series of events that we've been running since March, all have a linked development goals, which are 11 and 12. 11 is about impact and outcomes. And you see on the screen now, each development goal breaks down into three uh, elements, as I'm sure you're aware, workforce and education element, practice element, and science element. So this particular event relates to 11 impact and outcomes, as I've said, with so for the workforce aspect, that would be evidence of impact of the pharmaceutical workforce. For the practice element, evidence of impact of pharmaceutical services. And for science, it's really about making sure we have strategies and programs in place to enable timely access to safe, effective and affordable medical products. This event also relates to development goal 12, which is pharmacy intelligence. So for the workforce element, it's really about having a national strategy and corresponding actions to collect and share workforce data and workforce planning activities, as you can see on the screen. For the AE practice element, it's about having a comprehensive national strategy to collect, share and utilize intelligence on service provision, development and delivery. And for science, it's really having data-driven decision strategies to accelerate pharmaceutical research development, manufacturing, et cetera. The FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory is the engine room of global pharmaceutical data collection. And the FIP GPO will measure and monitor progress towards the development goals. The FIP GPO mission centers around data, intelligence, advocacy, and reporting. We know from the pandemic, the importance of data and for data to provide us with evidence which demonstrates impact. And a lot of data over the pandemic has demonstrated the impact of our profession in supporting the fight against COVID-19 as a very real example. So our first task is always to collate valid global data on workforce education, practice and pharmaceutical science. And we must undertake comprehensive analysis of collated data to provide accessible high quality intelligence. And all this must be communicated 
innovatively to promote our member organisations' impact on health. So it's very important uh, use as advocacy. This communication will often be via the FIP Atlas, which is our visualisation platform for displaying our data and intelligence across the globe. And finally, we will provide evidence-based strategic information, reports and guidance on the application of pharmaceutical science policies, practices and services. Briefly give you an overview of the work the FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory is doing. We continue to take a tried and tested needs-based approach to addressing data and development goal challenges. And um, Bob will be talking a bit about developing a needs-based data-driven culture in a moment. But through our multinational needs assessment program, we collate a lot of data that um, assesses nations' needs in particular areas. And the good examples where we've done that this year have been around booster vaccinations. We use the FIP GPO Atlas as a platform for showcasing our members' needs and priorities, supported by the data from the GPO. And this allows FIP to identify opportunities for developing pharmacy with, for, and through our member organizations. The GPO database is the repository for FIP's pharmacy and pharmaceutical science data, and it contains data that informs the indicators used to track progress against the FIP development goal. The FIP development goals provide the framework for needs assessments and prioritization for member organizations to undertake. I'll be discussing this further in our panel later on. And this is all relevant to their national situation. So in turn, the priorities can provide each organization with the foundations for mapping the progress and transformation for their workforce, practice and pharmaceutical science. Indicators, the reason why we're here today will be a way to measure and monitor progress and transformations for a nation or region's workforce, practice and pharmaceutical <clears throat> science, and we can measure against the development goals via the data we collate in the FIP GPO. So the Data and Intelligence Commission is a key uh, strategic body that advises FIP on the advocacy and delivery of the GPO project, and Bob will talk about that in a second. And it's particularly focused on the achievement of the vision of the GPO and the strategic objectives and member engagement. So you're all here today as part of one of our GPO data and intelligence digital events program. And we're pleased you've joined us, joined us for this event. So I'll hand back to Bob. So the Data and Intelligence Commission meets on a regular basis. And it has representatives across the global context of FIP, plus various FIP member organizations and activities. Uh, the commission provides strategic advice, as Chris had said, to FIP on the advocacy and delivery of the uh, GPO. And the commission is, uh, has made recently eight recommendations as steps to the development of a needs-based data-driven culture. They have recommended that FIP should develop common and accessible guidance and terminology on the data collection, processing, synthesis, and analysis. FIP should adopt and adapt for pharmacy and the, or the practice of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences, the World Health Organization's data principles. FIP should consider what it can offer to member organizations as added value to their membership with respect to data. FIP should serve as a global resource for collecting and disseminating best data practices and successes. Digital health, population health management, and data literacy learning outcomes should be incorporated into pharmacies' initial education and training curricula, as well as post-registration competency frameworks. FIP should continue to advocate for pharmacy to have full access and writability to patient electronic health records. The FIP uh, GPO should develop a clear and transparent governance process to enable data sharing between and among member organizations. And each FIP structure, constituency, and forum should identify a data champion who will be supported by the GPO team and really serve as a leader in that area. Chris? Thanks, Bob. So on to the FIP development goal indicators. And you'll see we've been discussing earlier that the FIP development goals are underpinned by the three elements, but they're also underpinned by mechanisms, which are tools and structures to facilitate and support the process of transformation. 
And then the indicators you'll see at the bottom of the pyramid are there to measure and monitor the progress of the FIP development goals. And the indicators will be used to support member organizations and nations to identify where improvements are needed, to set priorities for quality improvement and support, to create national dashboards displaying data against priority development goals. Indeed, you can track against progress against time and look at trends, to benchmark performance against international data, to support national quality improvement schemes, and to demonstrate progress that pharmacy is making in support of health systems outcomes. So back to you, Bob. Thank you very much, Chris. It really is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lena Bader. She is a UK trained and registered pharmacist, and she has been the FIP lead for equity, sustainability, policy, and development. Uh, Dr. Bader leads the FIP development goals uh, program of work and has truly done a tremendous job in this area. Dr. Bader. Thank you very much, uh, Bob and Chris, for that introduction, and also for setting a lot of the scene uh, for me, Chris. And I just wanted to uh, start by saying, of course, uh, two years on since the development goals have been launched, and we just celebrated their second anniversary. This is a very important conversation to have now. Um, we'll go to the next slide, and I just wanted to tell you what, I, what I'll spend a few minutes today doing is just sharing with you some of the data we have collected from our members on global, regional, and national priorities. But I first want to say that uh, indicators are such an important tool to help measure progress, and we, can't, we cannot do that without them. So this is a very important project. Uh, by FIP. And also when we launched the development goals a couple of years ago, a set of 21 goals, they were really intended as a framework for supporting transformation. And, and that depends on the priorities on a national and regional level. So also, just as it is important to have the indicators, it is also important to identify priorities so that countries and regions have a focused roadmap to work towards, um, as 21 goals may be too big. Uh, and that's not the intention anyway. So if we can move to the next slide, I wanted to start by saying that all of what I'm presenting today is really extracted from a recent report we've done last year, the FIP Development Goals Report 2021, setting goals for the decade ahead. The day we launched the development goals in 2020, September, we said that FIP is committed to supporting their mem our members identify their priorities. And that's exactly what we set out to do uh, the following months uh, and continuing until today. So this report, and I know my colleagues will um, add the URL, uh, URL link for where you can find that, provides a very comprehensive overview of global priorities, but also um, broken down into regions and nations within those regions. So feel free to have a look at that report uh, for a more in-depth overview. I'll provide a very high level summary of the global results, but also focusing, of course, on the European region, which we're here to discuss today. So on the next slide. Um, is a summary of uh, this report. Of course, as I said, we've committed to assisting our members in assessing and tracking their priorities and needs. And we followed through with this commitment immediately after launch. And we started with a, a global or a, a regional engagement strategy in 2021. And of course, you remember we were um, in the midst of the COVID um, pandemic. So we used uh, the virtual uh, platforms to do this. So our regional engagement strategy spread across the year, but continue until 2022. And I think it's something we'll be continuing with moving uh, on the future. We've, of course, um, assessed uh, all the six regions of the world, which uh, we uh, categorized based on WHO's uh, categories, and we have developed um, a set of summaries for each region. And the next slide explains a little bit more uh, through the animations of what we've done through the year. So we started in April of 2021 with a high level meeting. So these were different mechanisms. We used a combined approach of different mechanisms to conduct our regional engagement strategies. So April started with high level meetings with some member organizations. We then began our first virtual regional engagement meetings with each of the six regions. 
Um, then uh, throughout the summer in July and September, we held our second regional engagement meetings that built on the first uh, set and also continued to identify priorities. And of course, there was a lot of engagement in between to collect some data. In October, we conducted more member interviews. And then in November, had uh, held a third set of regional engagement meetings. And we continue to this day in 2022 with um, our regional engagement. So, in the next slide shows you um, a bar chart. This is really the, the global snapshot of uh, priority development goals um, across the world. It of course shows you the number of member organizations um, uh, on, the, on, the on the left uh, column. And uh, they have identified them against each of the 21 that you can see on the um, vertical uh, horizontal axis. For example, as you can see, number you know the highest bars on the screen, number seven, number 13, advanced integrated services and 13 policy development and a few others have been identified as a priority uh, uh, area for development by more countries than the others, around 16, 15 countries. And as you can see, this varies across the goals and across the regions. So this really provides them um, a very um, um, simple way of summarizing the needs. And as we re-evaluate um, the national and regional priorities, we expect that this bar chart to continue to change over years. And we hope it does as priorities uh, are met and new priorities are created. And the next slide is another way um, to view these global priorities. We've did, divided them up based on uh, the frequency um, by which they were identified as a priority. Um, and this by no means undermines any of the ones on the third or second levels, et cetera. This just provides a, a very simple way of viewing them. So the first level priority goals are those goals that have been identified by more countries than others as a priority. You'll see DG1, academic capacity, DG4, advanced specialist development, number seven, advancing integrated services, 13, policy development, 15, people-centered care, 19, patient safety, 20, digital health, 21, sustainability. And of course, you can view the report to see the others in more detail, but these were the most um, frequently identified uh, goals as a priority around the world. But of course, it is very important to look at a more regional level. So, uh, so we did, of course, do that for the six regions. And, and the next slide iterates that we've, of course, done that for Europe. Uh, for this region, we've had 21 members or member organizations uh, or, or observer organizations from Europe who have reported to us their priorities and um, which are, of course, based on their current national development needs at the time. So moving on to the next slide, what did the European uh, priorities um, concerning the DGs look like? So the first level priority goals, and again, identified, this is a summary of all 21 member organizations, uh, identified five first level priority goals. Um, that includes number seven, in, which is about integrating service, integrated services, number eight, working with others, 13 policy development, 20 digital health, and 21 sustainability in pharmacy. So you see a lot of them, or most of them align with the global priorities as well. And second level uh, priority goals span the different ones. And we can see a spread across workforce and practice focus goals across all levels. Um, we have to practice caution when we, um, um, you know, uh, summarize these goals. So this is by no means generalizing the region's priorities because we very much also recognize not only global variations between regions, but also national variations within each region. So the next couple of slides, I won't go through in detail, but the next one shows you a breakdown uh, per member organization of the goals. And you can see where a lot of them align. Number seven, for example, uh, has an X across it in a lot of these countries. And you can see that, of course, um, some of the other goals are identified. So there, there is some variation, but there's also some commonality. And that's why it's really important to have a look, uh, not only regionally, but uh, on a national level. The next slide, just for illustration, continues this, um, this table. But but again, I really invite you to have a look at the report for a more in-depth analysis and also for a summary of some case studies of how some of those countries are prioritizing the goals or have progressed some of them. And we hope that these case studies provide lessons learned. 
And uh, on a final note, I'll end by saying that we will continue supporting our member organizations with their priorities. Uh, we will be following up on these priorities to see whether there have been any updates or any new priorities have emerged. We will continue to provide support to more uh, member organizations who not necessarily have contributed to this mapping, but to continue to follow up with them to understand their needs as well, including new member organizations joining FIP. And we will be continuing to share the best practices from the development goals. And I know we have a couple of examples from the region, which will be shared later at the panel discussion. So I'll end here and very happy to take on any questions live or via the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lena, for taking us through that uh, view of global priorities right through to European priorities and even taking us down to a granular national level. Okay, so moving on, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speakers who are our double act. And we have my colleague Farah Akwad from the uh, FIP GPO team. Farah is FIP Regional Engagement Support and Development Manager. And she will be speaking with Diala Kumani, who is a researcher at the FIP UCL Collaborating Center. And I give you the floor. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Chris, and welcome, everyone. I'll start this presentation with a quick introduction before handing it over to Diala, building on what Lina just presented. So in 2020, FIP published the set of 21 development goals. And as part of the FIP DGs, a growing set of global tools, structures, programs uh, were also available to facilitate the support um, for a process of transformation. During 2021 and 2022, FIP focused on engaging with members around the world, as Lina mentioned. We tried to support them in identifying and mapping their needs on a national and regional level aligned with the FIP development goals. And Lina just presented some of the DG priorities that we collected last year. But in addition to that, many member organizations are also mapping the development goals based on their outputs, their activities, their programs and their internal structures. So using the FIP development goals as a framework, we were able to answer the following question. What is the pharmaceutical uh, needs to meet national global healthcare requirements? Which is what we're doing uh, using the engagement strategy. The question is now, we, we've mobilized the, we're, mobile, we, we're actually mobilizing the use of the development goals in needs assessments, but how can we monitor our progress towards meeting these identified needs to improve pharmaceutical health delivery systems? So member organizations against, against their nationally identified needs or regionally, and FIP, how can we monitor our progress to, globally towards the development goals? During FIP's Global Congress, Seville, we continued to discuss uh, the FIP development goals mapping, the implementation efforts by different member organizations. And we will continue to do so with our members to share their best practices, their experiences, and their approaches to implement the uh, development goals. FIP GPO, the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory, and Data and Intelligence Hub has designed and developed progress indicators to support tracking progress towards these goals. So for measuring progress toward identified national development goals and needs, whether it's national, regional, or global monitoring. I'll now hand it over to my colleague Diala, and she'll give you an overview about these uh, indicators. Diala, over to you. Uh, thank you, Farah, for this introduction. And thank you uh, also, Chris, for intro introducing me. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today at this event. Uh, I will start now by giving a brief overview of the project, highlighting the different data collection and analysis methods used throughout the development process of the Global Fifth Development Goals Indicators. As we can see here on the slide, the process involved conducting a series of qualitative research methods, including a desktop literature review, followed by a Delphi method, and this was stage one of the project. Later, a quantitative online questionnaire was incorporated uh, into the second stage or the global engagement stage. And I think many of our today's attendees are familiar with this questionnaire image presented here on the slide and answered this questionnaire. So, so I would like here to thank you all again for your valuable contribution. For the analysis, uh, also qualitative and quanti quantitative analysis methods were performed to analyze both stage to finally develop the presented list of global FIP development uh, 
Profit Development Goals Indicators presented here on the slide. Uh, moving on to this next slide, uh, please. Uh, in this slide, I will go uh, into more uh, detail about the met methodology and the data, uh, data collection process. As I mentioned in my pre previous slide, that a mixed me method research design was used, qualitative and quantitative. And the aim of the stage one, the qualitative stage, was to identify the initial draft list of global FIP development goals indicators. Therefore, the development of process uh, of, uh, of proposed indicators involved first a content analysis uh, of the relevant documents and the ex existing data collected from global published reports and surveys by WHO and the FIP. This was followed by a Delphi process to identify and develop potential indicators aligned and mapped to the 21 development goals. So the aim of the Delphi method was to reach an initial consensus on the proposed list of indicators assigned by an expert group. And this led to the development of 21 and validated proposed list of indicators covering different aspects of each development goal and ready to be used in the next stage. Moving to the next stage, uh, I mean the st stage two or the quantitative stage, uh, this stage was aimed to construct the valid validity of the proposed uh, and validated development indicators produced from stage one in terms of the indicators relevancy and availability or the accessibility from a global perspective. So the outcomes of the Delphi method were presented for wider engagement and used to conduct a global cross-sectional online questionnaire to assess and validate the relevancy and availability of the 21 proposed list of progress indicators. Uh, the 21 questionnaire links were disseminated during a series of FIP digital events held in 2021. One event was held for HDG, where the attendees of HDG event who were international pharmacists working at uh, or across different sectors and career stages participated in this short questionnaire. Also a follow-up email or an invitation email was sent to global pharmacy leaders who uh, represent their professional leaders, leadership association or leadership bodies to participate in this questionnaire through the FIP different sections as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide here shows the analysis and main outcomes of stage one. A content analysis approach was undertaken to draft the primary pharmacy core-related uh, core indicators. And the output was the development of the GPO core indicators handbook comprising a list of 127 pharmacy-related core indicators. And this handbook uh, list was used as input for the Delphi process. Uh, afterward, an expert group of international pharmacists volunteered to contribute in an anonymous two-round Delphi method, and they were asked to assign uh, independently the relevancy of indicators listed in the GPO indicators and handbook and the published fifth development goals mechanism against each de development goal. Uh, also, the expert group was uh, asked to provide further comments and feedback on the output of their first round. Eventually, after amending and incorporating all expert group comments, initial consensus, uh, cons consensus was met and 21 proposed list of 165 unvalidated indicators were developed aligned to the 21 developing codes. Then the output of the Delphi, uh, Delphi process or technique, technique was formatted into a questionnaire to be used for the global engagement or stage two. Uh, moving on to the next uh, slide, please, Chris. Uh, here, is, here we can see here the descriptive, descriptive data analysis for stage two, the online questionnaire or the global engagement stage. Uh, a total of 755 participants responded to the 21 online questionnaires from different practice areas and the six WHO regions. And as we can see here on the map that the Western Pacific uh, regions and the European regions were the regions with the highest response rate. Uh, uh, around with 31 and 23 percent respectively. And the responses from the other four regions were nearly uh, evenly distributed, ranging from 10 to, to 12 percent of the total response rate each. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a bit of a heavy slide and it's showing the statistical analysis performed for the same stage. Based on the two questions listed in the online questionnaire about describing the relevancy and the availability of the proposed indicators, two selection criteria were set to determine if an indicator is a globally valid and measurable indicators. 
So as shown here on the slide, the first, first criterion is the relevancy of the proposed indicators to measure progress for each relevant uh, development goal from a global perspective. And the second criterion is the availability or the accessibility of these proposed indicators in different countries. The analysis of the questionnaire response, uh, responses was performed using two statistical approach. Uh, the first fi figure here uh, shows the first uh, approach, which is the outliers detection using the box plot examination to identify the not relevant indicators. And the analysis resulted in the exclusion of 10 indicators from the initially proposed list of indicators, I mean from the 165 indicators. Uh, the second approach, uh, we can see, uh, Chris, if you can move uh, to the next approach, please. Okay, thank you. The second approach is by setting or establishing three evidence-based uh, thresholds to indicate the level of performance or the level of usability of the indicators. As illustrated here in the diagram, for example, if the, ex if the availability of an indicator is above or equal uh, 60%, it's classified as a usable indicator. If the availability is between 40 to 59%, it's classified as a problematic indicator. And if the availability is below 40%, it's classified as a not, not usable or rejected indicator. For analysis purpose, only the relevant indicators which passed the first criterion uh, were used and compared with the country's responses to ensure the indicators availability and accessibility in order to meet the second criteria. And the analysis of this stage generated 109 usable indicators uh, ready to be tested after meeting both criteria, 40 problematic indicators to be reviewed later, and also produced 16 indicators that were rejected. Uh, moving on to the final slide. Okay, uh, in this slide, I will point out the resulting key outcomes. Uh, so first, the main outcome is a set of correlated and validated transnational evidence-based indicators that will monitor development goals progress worldwide and support countries in the process of their pharmacy advancement and transformation. The second point or the second key point is that the final list of development goals indicators was presented uh, in the 21 development goals and across the three uh, DGs elements, I mean workforce, uh, education, practice, and science, with one indicator under each uh, development goals, at least. If we uh, move uh, the slide, yeah, thank you. It's also worth uh, worth mentioning that some of uh, the development goals, particularly the ones we can see here on the slide, uh, DG11, Impact and Outcomes, DG12, Pharmacy Intelligence, and DG12, uh, 20, Digital Health, have only one or two indicators under the final usable or the final uh, agreed list of indicators. However, the questionnaire analysis showed that the initially proposed indicators of these goals were relevant to the context area of these development goals. I mean, they met the first criterion of a measurable global indicator in terms of relevancy, but they didn't meet the second criterion, the availability or accessibility assessment in the respondent countries. But I think we can say here, or we can agree that although data and intelligence, the focus areas of these development goals are considered new emerging areas and show rapid growth in the healthcare field, the existence of national strategies and systems of implementation is still relatively limited. And then a lack of measures to monitor service impact and health outcomes is expected and not really surprising. Uh, finally, uh, the developed list of indicators was also clustered into five categories to present the develop, development goals indicators as a second dimension. So for example, we have uh, capacity type indicators where data is expressed as numbers, like the number of pharmacists, pharmacies, etc. We also have impact type indicators to measure the impact and health outcomes of the pharmaceutical services provided. We have pharmaceutical services and facilities type indicators which focus on the avail availability of the pharmaceutical services, facilities, and infrastructures needed, uh, and, policies and policies and regulatory systems time type indicators, which focus on the regulations and strategies as drivers to shape the structure of the needed system to improve health outcomes. Finally, we have training and professional development type indicators, which focus on developing competencies and skills across all sectors and career stages. This was a short overview of how the global development goals indicators were developed. 
as evidence-driven global developmental work using research methods to support tracking progress towards the FIP development goals. Thank you all for your listening, and I will hand it, uh, hand it over again to my colleague Farah. She will take you through the project next step. Farah, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Diala. So as we've heard from Diala, this globally validated list of indicators across all of the development goals will be used to monitor progress worldwide. And it will be also used to support each country in the process of transformation, whether it's for the workforce, education, practice, or pharmaceutical science. FIP is currently preparing a tool for the selection of indicators and a framework for monitoring and evaluating them. This in turn will enable the design of global Atlas dashboards that will drive and inform progress towards the development goals. If we can go to the next slide. The development goals indicators framework, uh, this aims to support tracking progress of pharmacy practice, workforce and education and science elements of the DGs at a national or member organizational level. So there are three specific objectives that will be served by this framework. Number one is supporting member organizations in tracking and monitoring their progress towards achieving the development goals. The second point is ensuring that development goals monitoring is aligned with existing member organizational and national monitoring frameworks, so as to facilitate global comparisons of progress monitoring and improvement activities, in, or, in addition to addressing data gaps and minimizing the burden of reporting. Uh, the third point is enabling global tracking of the progress of member organizations and stakeholders towards the DGs through the provision and alignment of a global set of indicators that can assess in multinational review of aggregated data. If we can move on to the next slide. Now, what are the intended benefits for the DGs indicators framework? This framework will synergize global, regional, and national monitoring efforts and provide the following benefits. So in order to monitor progress towards the development goals, it can be tailored to specific national and organizational contexts. As we know, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. But at the same time, the development of standardized monitoring framework will reduce the variability between nations when it comes to monitoring and integration. In addition, it will provide guidance on areas that are not traditionally measured and explored by mem member nations or organizations. If we can go to the next slide. On the screen, you will see our proposed process proposed process for tracking the development goals. So first is selecting the development goals to be tracked. Our recommendation is to follow these steps in order to determine your priority development goals. One, identify the general areas in which you're active, the policies, the projects that are currently in place and prioritized, or the project projects that are currently being implemented. You should also consider the pressing national needs that you wish to address and focus on. For our member organizations and stakeholders, you can then identify the top five development goals priorities relevant to your organization's missions, plans, programs, and needs in a specified time frame. Then, based on the development goals priorities, we select the appropriate ind indicators. Indicators are useful to provide measurable results to demonstrate progress towards the development goals, identify areas needing attention and opportunities for improvement, and also support continuous improvement. So measurement cannot be undertaken in isolation, and we look forward to working with all member organizations towards mobilizing the use of these indicators. The next step is developing a monitoring and evaluation framework. We will identify specific questions that uh, need to be addressed in order to assess track progress towards the development goals. For example, what is being monitored? We make links to data sources and how these will be reported. As you can see, monitoring refers to the observation of progress, quality of activities on an ongoing basis, whilst evaluation refers to the process of determining the worth or significance of a service or intervention related to the development goal. Finally, the Atlas dashboards can be an effective tool for presenting all of this data, and it changes over time to inform and drive improvement. It is possible to provide a summary of a limited set of key indicators with novel ways of highlighting areas in which the profession is uh, developing or experiencing uh, some challenges. These have potential to support regular review progress, monitoring best practices and trends, and improving uh, data quality. I think this is my last slide. 
I'm going to pass it back to Bob, and I'm happy to receive any questions in the Q&A box. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's really an informative presentation. And uh, indeed, if any of you have any questions, please do submit them to the question uh, box that you have down at the bottom part of your screen, and we'll uh, go ahead and get them answered for you. But next, I think we're in an exciting portion of the program. And uh, I want to say hello, panelists. Uh, I want to thank each of the panelists that we're going to have for their participation in this event, Creating Development Goal Indicators, Bridging Data and Outcomes. And we really do have an outstanding panel. Uh, in our panel today uh, will be Dr. Adam Rathborn. He's a member of the FIP Data and Intelligence Commission. He's a senior lecturer in the clinical and social pharmacy uh, at Newcastle University. And uh, he has research interest in medicines use, health services research, human behaviors, and lived experiences of medicine use. So thank you very much, Dr. Rathborn. Our next panelist is Laura Mora. Uh, she's Deputy Executive Secretary uh, with the Portuguese Pharmaceutical uh, Society. Uh, she's responsible for the practical implementation of the FIP development goals. So she's just perfect for this panel of the Portuguese uh, Pharmaceutical Society. And she has a PhD uh, research is in education and training in clinical pharmacy. Our third panelist today is Safia Chansil, and she is the uh, an owner and a pharmacist in charge of a pharmacy uh, with her name. She's a member of the Turkish, or uh, she's in, in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, and she is the FIP ECPG president elect in 2022. Uh, she's a community pharmacist, as I said, and so certainly brings a wonderful perspective. So thank you very much, guys, for joining us today. Uh, maybe the way to get started is to just ask a general question of the three of you, and that is, do the regional development goal priorities described earlier in Dr. Lena Boehner's session resonate with your national needs? Should we just unmute and then start chatting? Sounds good. So, so I guess from so first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to be on this panel. It's a, it's a very uh, prestigious honor. So thank you for that. Um, I think the presentations we've heard have been really interesting. Um, and from a, a UK perspective, um, obviously within a, a broader Europe, um, they definitely do align with our priorities. So within our kind of my practice role in a secondary care organization, we've noticed a big shift from this kind of organizational boundaries that used to be in place that would prevent us working together and, and making progress on shared elements of pharmacy practice and science. Over the last five years, those boundaries have started to disappear. And rather than working for one organization that delivers secondary care, we've started to work for integrated care organizations that deliver care in different platforms across different ways um, to meet patients' needs. I think that becomes really tricky to monitor and to, to keep track of what's going on and where it's going on and how it's going on and how we're developing these, these roles. So I think the, the indicators that have been identified and the development goals that have been um, proposed are, are really aligned to, to what we see in Europe at the moment. That's great. Yeah, I would like to first first of all thank you, uh, uh, thank to FIP uh, for the opportunity to share our work in Portugal, uh, mainly in Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society. Um, yeah, I agree with Adam. Uh, this is perfectly aligned with the regional uh, priorities um, and what we are doing uh, nationally in Portugal. Uh, I think that we are going to have more questions. Uh, to explore a little bit what we are doing uh, in Portugal and in uh, my colleagues' uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and giving me the floor and inviting me to be a uh, panelist for this session. So um, I would like to um, briefly give an information about the National Pharmacist Association, the Cyprus Turkish Pharmacist Association, CATEP that we are the leading advocacy organization for pharmacy and pharmacists in Cyprus, promoting improved public health through the provision of information, education, and networking opportunities. So uh, we do definitely think that uh, we're aligning with the FIP development goals regionally and also globally. 
So um, as the fifth development goals align with FIP mission to support global health by enabling the advancements of pharmacy practice science and education and to transform pharmacy in alignment with the UN SDGs. So we truly think that the goals are fully aligned towards one FIP as well as striving towards the SDGs 2030. So thank you. Fantastic. I do also wanted to mention that, uh, and many of you will have seen this as you follow in the chat, but a very detailed bios of all of our speakers and all of our panelists are in the in the chat. Uh, so please do take a look because they're just uh, no way we could introduce them uh, to really bring out all of their uh, skills and experiences that they bring to this discussion. So if we might talk a little bit in further detail. So from the 21 development goals we've highlighted today, which goal or goals would you describe as a priority for your organization? Maybe we'd start with Safia. Sure. So thank you so much. Our um, main goal that we have also highlighted in the global uh, network that we have submitted to FIP was actually the ninth, the continuing professional development strategies, 13th, policy development, 19th, patient safety, as well as the uh, fourth, advanced specialist development. However, we have also noticed that there is a, um, an important part that we are actually, um, we haven't foreseen. So this is why we have uh, switched our uh, main focus areas from those four, but we're still having them as our priorities, of course. But the main um, strategy that we need to focus on um, became the early career training strategy, because uh, since the past two, three years, we have been experiencing a lot of uh, new pharmacists, early career pharmacists joining and graduating, completing their uh, registrations. So this is why it is really important to have uh, early career training strategy as our main focus, as well as advanced and specialist development and the CPD strategies. So two, four and uh, nine have been the main focus for us at the moment in order to uh, expand our workforce and to develop um, the pharmacists in our country. Great, Laura? Yeah, so uh, the, the FIP development goals there uh, that we reported back in 2021 are the same uh, as I'm going to talk right now. Uh, so um, the top priorities for us uh, is the uh, DG5 competency framework, DG7 advancing integrated services and DG13 policy development. And those are the DGs that are most aligned with our uh, three national priorities for the Portuguese uh, Pharmaceutical Society. Uh, that I would, if I have time, I would like to, to mention uh, the three uh, national priorities that we have are, uh, the first one is to, is to guarantee the access to health data by pharmacies. So for example, uh, my community pharmacist nowadays does not have access to uh, the information collected by my medical doctor. And uh, this creates an enormous difficulty uh, in providing healthcare uh, to the, uh, due to the loss of information. So it's very important for us that pharmacists uh, in all settings have access uh, to the patient data. Um, the second priority is the, uh, to guarantee successful implementation of the pharmaceutical career in the national health system. And the third uh, priority is to promote uh, the implementation uh, and reimbursement of new uh, pharmaceutical services, such as medical renewal, individualized medication preparation, medication review, et cetera. And uh, to accomplish these priorities, we of course need to reinforce competency-based education, integrate services, highlight the role of the pharmacies as healthcare professional and as part of the health workforce, and of course be proactive and cooperate in policy development. So we of course have, uh, um, are developing lots of uh, FIP development goals, but uh, those three are the priorities. Thanks. Fantastic. Okay, uh, Adam. Thank you for, for that question. It's a really interesting one. Um, in the UK, we have a proposal or a legislative movement that's going to make all pharmacists prescribers um over the next five to ten years so one of our key goals would be number two um where there's a lot of work currently happening about early career training and strategy 
for pharmacists to move from a dispensing role into a prescribing role. Um, and there's a lot of work happening at the minute across the schools of pharmacy that I've worked in um, that are, are looking at how you implement prescribing training into the undergraduate pharmacy curriculum. So that's, that would be kind of one of our national priorities. And then the other priorities that I think that align with the, the DG is just to kind of keep it as a trio like everybody else has. Um, as I mentioned, we've got increasingly integrated services in, in England and, and the rest of Europe. So I think there's, that's again another place where people are, are trying to prioritise how we integrate the services of professions that used to be quite sectoral. So you would have retail pharmacists not necessarily talking to hospital pharmacists who maybe wouldn't talk to industrial or academic pharmacists. And increasingly, we're seeing these merging of roles where people are working in multiple sectors at the same time um, and need a different set of skills to what traditionally would have been would have been asked for from, from pharmacy workforce. So I think two and seven, and then I think maybe the last one that people would focus on um, from, from kind of in my experience of, of working in, in secondary care and, and in academia would be the sustainability of, of pharmacy services. So as we move towards um, kind of a climate disaster, people are becoming a little bit more cognizant of how pharmaceuticals are influencing the climate, um, how the decisions we make at a dispensing or prescribing level have an impact on the climate. So whether we decide to provide liquid formulations or solid oral dosage forms has an impact on the climate. And so we need to start to think about those decisions and, and how we develop the sustainability of, of pharmacy. So, so those are the, the priorities for for us, I would say. So, so number two, early career training, prescribing training. Number seven, how we work and integrate the services that we've, we've already got. And then number 21, the sustainability of the pharmacy services that we provide. This is really interesting when we look at it over the three panelists and the difference, but now exciting. But if I might now, maybe uh, what we should do is maybe look at the gaps a little bit. And for that, if what you would do is take one of those three priorities that you talked about, and uh, talk a little bit about what data and intelligence is needed to track progress of that priority and what data is available so we can start looking at gaps. And maybe we'll just reverse the order again. Maybe Adam? Yeah, so if I, if I kind of focus on maybe the early career training strategy and development goal. So the types of data that is currently or is being collected um, about this would be the number and content of placement hours in in undergraduate curriculum so it's kind of counting the number of times a student pharmacist or a trainee pharmacist would get to speak to a patient be involved in the decision making process um, and that quantitative data is showing us that not very many trainees get early exposure to to patients and decision making and so within my organization we've started to look at you know, how we're going to monitor this going forward and, and what types of data we're going to need. And the data that we're finding the most useful is qualitative data that we're mm -hmm. collecting from trainees. Um, so that data is giving us information that we hadn't anticipated, that we hadn't put into our surveys, that we hadn't linked to an indicator. Um, the rich and detailed nature of qualitative data is allowing us to see things in a way we hadn't previously thought about. Um, and I think whenever we've come to a quantitative um, data approach, we've always had to bring with us some sort of bias or prejudice about the type of data we wanted and what we wanted to find out. So we'll ask this question to get this data. Um, <laughs> and when you do qualitative data collection, it's much broader. And so it's harder to, to get that type of data that you can kind of be influenced by your prejudice or bias. So the, the qualitative data that we've got for our early career training has really been useful in, in changing the way we've structured the training for our trainees. Um, and what we've decided to focus on um, has come directly from that qualitative data that we've had. So, so for me, it would be a focus on the qualitative data collection that will bring Kind of an open-mindedness and and spread the, the horizon or spread the boundaries of, of what we what we think we know about a particular development goal by linking qualitative data to it you might be able to think about that development goal in a slightly different way 
Oh, fantastic. That really is really quite thoughtful and it certainly becomes important to our discussion today. Laura? Yeah, uh, I will choose uh, the G5 competency framework. Uh, in Portugal, we, all, we already have four approved competencies, which are pharmaceutical oncology, pharmaceutical uh, medicine, health management and, and administration, and also public health. And I think that uh, we can probably in the future uh, measure the number of competencies uh, provided by the Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society, how many pharmacists are, have their competencies, and what is the real uh, impact um, of the service provided by the pharmacies that hold uh, that specific uh, competency? Great, and Safia? Well, uh, Adam has already explained uh, and given a really good insight for the DG number uh, three. So this is why I will be uh, speaking and giving a brief example uh, in regards to the continuing professional development strategies and on specialist development. So I'll be uh, merging both of them and giving you an insight from Cyprus that um, over the last year, um, one and a half year, we have uh, collaborated with a university and um, created the sports pharmacy um, specialization for our pharmacists. And uh, through that uh, training program, we have um, expanded our um, specialization of the pharmacist that we at the moment have 10 um, pharmacists that are legally uh, also registered as sports pharmacists in addition to their own um, pharmacy um, IDs. So uh, for that, we have been collaborating with the um, national uh, sports organizations. However, at the moment, we're still pending the um, main organization, the federation's uh, approval. So the data collection has been uh, set up, but the qualitative uh, part of the um, the um, data collection um, has been uh, on hold at the moment. So this is why um, we have been trying to expand and promote to also uh, show uh, specific examples from other countries in order to uh, start having those uh, pharmacists to be um, starting to also do patient counseling and um, giving um, help and also um, exploring themselves and um, developing um, their specialization, not only with the, um, the education part, but also with the practical part. So at the moment, we'll be focusing more on the practical part after we're having the um, official approval by the Federation. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, Chris, I think I'll turn it over to you to sort of pull everything together and wrap us up. Thanks, Bob. I'll share some final slides on, on the screen right now. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us and to our, particularly to uh, our panelists who gave us some perspectives there on what the priorities are in their particular countries across Europe and developments and work underway to advance the profession. It sounds like a lot of the priorities are in a kind of uh, workforce sort of area and um, also around integrating care al along across the, the boundaries of primary, secondary, tertiary care. So thanks again. And I'll just conclude with heard today the work of the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory and the Data and Intelligence Commission. Uh, Lena took us through the uh, priorities globally for the development goals, as well as focusing in on Europe and, and some of the nations within Europe. And then we've had Farah and Diala really showing us how the 109 development goal indicators have been developed. Of course, that is quite a large number. We couldn't go through them all today. You will be familiar with some of the indicators, I'm sure. They would include things like pharmacist density per 10,000 of population, which is a good capacity standardized indicator. And then, of course, we've finally had our panel discussion. So I hope you've been able to get some insights into the development goal indicators and 
we will keep you posted about next steps and we will be releasing a framework of development goal indicators in due course. So just a uh, final few slides. If you want to know more about any of the work going on at the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory, they, we have a microsite and the address is on the screen now. If you're interested in any of the other events being held, digital events being held by FIP, please visit events.fip.org. Thank you for all attending. Thank you to Bob, uh, Professor Robert Sindelar, my co-moderator uh, for moderating today. And it's uh, very early in the morning where he is. So thank you so much, Bob. And I just wish you all a good day and thank you for joining us.